Good are morning. So blessed and thankful for the many godly women that God has placed in the life at Isle of Faith United Methodist Church. You have paved the way for where we are now, along with the faithful women of Ruth Circle and the mighty prayer warriors that meet weekly to pray for the needs of our church and beyond. We'd like to introduce WOG, which stands for Women of Grace. We invite all women to come and share with authenticity and vulnerability their stories of grace. Come and be a part of what God is doing in and through the lives of the women of our church. We were never meant to do life alone. Let's learn, walk, and grow in the overflowing love and grace of God together. Good morning. Welcome to Isle of Faith. We are so glad you are here on this beautiful early fall morning. I love it when the humidity starts to abate a little bit. So very nice. Jaguars did well this week. We, we've got an aspiring looking rookie quarterback that we've got some hope for. Florida's teams did well yesterday. I'm a, I'm a graduate. I went to Georgia and so my team did well. I I hear some team in Alabama did something, I don't know, really, really, really not important. <laughs> look, uh, if you look behind me, look at all these lovely, lovely women. Your eyes are not deceiving you. There are no men up here today. The service today will be held by the Women of Grace, the women, as the video discussed. Um, rest assured, next week the men will be back. So next week all the guys will be here and the women will be in the congregation with you supporting our handsome men so please bring a friend come back next week and support the guys up here and then the following week and we haven't even shared this with will yet you know when he goes out of town stuff happens the following week we're going to have a dance off <laughs> so make sure we're, we're not having a dance off i'm you know. That would be epic, but we're not having a dance off. And if you, everybody be really quiet. Do you, do you hear it? Shh, do, you, do, do you hear that? That is the sound of pumpkins growing. <laughs> These pumpkins, I talked to one of the drivers that unloaded, that helped us with the truck one year, and he said, Imagine acres and acres as far as your eye can see of nothing but pumpkins growing in the field. That's what these little guys are doing now. They've gone from green to yellow. They're orange now. They're just, they're, they're putting their hearts into it, guys. They're just getting bigger and bigger. They are coming. We need to be prepared for these pumpkins. You can see the volunteer opportunities up here. There's going to be a pamphlet in next week's bulletin telling you more about it. But there's um, a lot of volunteer needs to do. If you've been involved with this church in the past, you know how big our pumpkin patch is and how many volunteers we need to make it successful. There's um, a sign-up sheet in the mission hall that will give you some ideas of needs we still have. If you're a little intimidated by something, get your small group to help out. Get your Sunday school class to help out. Grab a friend. You will be blessed, and it is a blessing to be in that pumpkin patch. And I think Miss Tina is going to lead us in a prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. You're so gracious to let us be here to worship you. We lift up each and every lady that is here. We thank you for their grace. We ask that the testimonies this morning touch our hearts, help us to be better Christians, help us to be the type of person you want us to be, and go out and let, it, let us be fishers of men for you. Thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for every blessing and everything that you've done for us. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and worship.
conference here um, and as Megan and I were praying about it the um, theme of the conference is going to be raise a hallelujah what can keep us from worshiping God I hope it's nothing I hope that nothing can cause us to raise our voices to make our bodies a living sacrifice for Jesus
voice in my life and father how you brought us through sing it with me when deep were the wounds and dark was the night the promise of your
worshiping with us. Be seated. Let's have our children come up. Today, Miss Tracy is our Director of Children's Ministries, and she is going to be doing our children's moment. Tracy? Okay, a microphone, that puts a lot of pressure. Okay. So, for those of you who don't know me, I am Miss Tracy. These are my crazy kids, Landon and Finn. But I just want to take a minute and talk to you about the different kind of groups that you guys belong to. Can you think of any groups that you guys belong to? What about a team? Are any of you on a soccer team? Or a... So we got, that's a group, right? What about school? Who's in kindergarten? So you're part of the kindergarten group. And what about the first, grade group. the first grade group? Can anyone else think of any types of groups that you guys belong to? Third grade, Cub Scouts. Um, <laughs> There's all kinds of groups that we belong to. But the group that I think is really special today is our Christian group and this family that we belong to right here. So we're all believers of Christ. And look about, look at all these people out here. Do you see all these people? Look at all that experience with Christ that's out there. Many years. So if ever you guys need someone to talk to about your journey with Christ, we're all believers, so we can all help. You can turn to any of us, okay? So today we're going to concentrate on the love as a group of Christians. How does that sound? <laughs> all right. That's all I got. <laughs> you guys can go ahead and go to class. Let's say the prayer over our children. Oh, we got to say our, chair, our prayer. I forget about that. I'm so sorry. Okay. Lord, Lord, children in your care, we ask God's blessing so that we will devote ourselves to the Christian upbringing of these children. That they will accept the guidance they need to grow in your likeness. Amen. Okay, now we can be dismissed. Sorry. We're going to continue in worship by receiving, receiving our tithes and offerings. So ushers come forward. so glad that you joined us for Women's Sunday. Um, I started this church at 2014. I did have some relationships, but I realized that I really didn't know and connect with many of the women in the church. And so um, my heart was kind of burdened for that. And I felt like that God was really leading uh, me to try to implement something that would really allow some more connection with women so I just wouldn't know faces or just first names but um, people that I could do life with and so um, WOG began Women of Grace. Hi I'm Megan Carlin I joined Isle of Faith in 2016. In 2017 I met Jude it's funny because I remember telling her I'd help out with some online stuff and that I could organize this and organize that and do all that. And somehow, I'm not really sure how, that led to me partnering with Jude. And it, at first I was really scared about that. But I've come to actually love it and it's one of my favorite parts of my life now, actually. So WOG stands for Women of Grace. And uh, the reason why that means so much to me is the Bible says that those who have been forgiven much love much, and those who have been forgiven little love little. And I know the grace that God has displayed in my life through my story, through my mistakes, even through the way the enemy has tried to destroy me. And it is God's grace that has sustained me and has allowed me not only to receive his grace for me, but extend that to others. And so I wanted to share that with other women.
Wog. What does that mean to me? Besides just women of grace, to me it's friendship and it's the people that I can rely on and it's the people that know me and where I can go and feel loved and confident and surrounded by God and just be happy. into these stories and we ask other women um, to be brave enough to share their stories um, and to see how God has worked in and through their stories to know that we are never alone, that he loves us, that he cares for us, and that he who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. So that is our uh, stories, of, stories of Grace series. And the Stories of Grace series leads into our um, Wog Connect series. And where one woman takes over the series, um, series of Grace, the Connect is more filtered to all the women and connecting together. And it's on, on a more intimate level. The other part of our of Wog is the social concept and the social aspects. And we have different events that where it's, it's more geared towards having fun and, and getting to know each other and being able to build those relationships so that you can get to know somebody. I know for some women it's not easy to be in a social setting or in a group setting and I know even for myself um, it's not the most comfortable thing but there is a risk involved in connection and relationships but I assure you that God created us for relationship. He created us for connection. And so this is an opportunity that we have to connect as women of God, to share our stories, to be able to connect with one another in a way to walk out our stories together and to truly be women of grace to one another. Also, if you have questions, feel free to contact Megan or myself. And outside of my office, there is the poster board um, that has all of our dates for 2019 and 2020. So make sure to check that out. I'm reading from the scripture passage today is Genesis 3, 1 through 7a. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree, the, you, you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good and for food, good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave it to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. When they at, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. This meeting is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I'm Reverend Connie Hastings. I'm a retired deacon from the Peninsula Delaware Conference. And as God planned it, my husband Bob and I landed here at Isle of Faith, and we have just been so welcomed by you, and so, um, so you've been so receptive of what ministries that we have to offer. And I do thank you for that. And now, before we begin, let us go before our God in prayer. Gracious God, it is with joy that we, we come here. And we come here, Lord, with expectation an expectation that through the witness, the testimony, the praise that is given to you, that we will learn more of you and learn more of your will for us. So in that, dear God, we just ask that we humbly 
prepare ourselves to receive that message and to come before you as you would have us be. We give this to you then in Jesus' blessed and holy name. Amen. There's a story about a snail who slowly creeps up to a door. He's finally able to get high enough to ring the doorbell. A mean, tall character answers and looks around, irritated by what he thinks is a stupid practical joke. Just before slamming the door shut, he sees the snail, and in disgust, he picks it up and throws it about 50 yards away. A full year later, the snail recovers, picks himself up, goes back to that same door, again rings the doorbell, and is met by the same character who hasn't changed in character or demeanor. But this time the snail says, what was that all about? This story, along with that that we read in Genesis, are wonderful examples of boundaries, setting loving limits on ourselves and others, and the problems people have had with them just about since forever. In the garden, the man and the woman seemingly had the run of Eden. They could live and love and, best of all, had no separation from God, their creator. The only thing that was asked of them not to do was to eat from the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Just one thing, just one tree, you'd think that wouldn't be such a big deal. But the serpent comes along telling the woman exactly what she wanted to hear. You will not die. You will be like God if you eat it. Now, there's plenty of theological discourse about what was happening here. But for today, let's just consider this. One boundary was set, one boundary was violated, and the world was lost. Consequences set in. The most lasting was they were banished from the garden and lost that close relationship they had with God and with each other. Yes, they realized as well, forgiveness, mercy, grace, as God provided them animal skins to cover them in their newly realized nakedness. But life would never be the same for them, and what we know is sin, that which separates us from God and each other, had entered the world. In the story of the snail, the poor little thing asked, what was that all about? Why did this mean brute of a guy react so violently when all the, the snail did was to ring his doorbell, maybe wanted to come in with him and have a friendship, you know, and, and just be with him? When hurled across the yard, when hurt and abused, just for being who he was, the snail can't figure out what happened. It illustrates how often people do not deal with boundary violations, and when they make attempts finally to redress the problem, they're just about as potent as a snail long forgotten by an unloving character as one could meet. I'm going to refer now to the book Boundaries by Henry Cloud and John Townsend. Both are clinical psychologists and have written what is probably the most referred book by pastors and Christian counselors. Now, that's a large statement, I realize, but honestly, if you have only two books in your life, read the Bible, read it every day, and read Boundaries along with it. You will find in them both God-given spiritual principles and good psychology. Both will not only change your life, but keep your life, and those you love in a place of affirming hope that fulfills the kingdom of God. Now, I realize that's a large declaration on my part, but certainly as a nationally certified counselor for nearly 20 years, I found that people who have so many issues in their families and other relationships, who even know depression and anxiety, are persons who never learn to set boundaries and or know how to respect boundaries that are expressed to them. They feel just as if they'd been the ones kicked out of Eden or thrown th uh, 50 yards from the doorbell. Understanding boundaries can help us avoid sorrow and pain that is brought on us by others and ourselves. However, this is not just a problem for the world or for the counselor's office. It's just as prevalent within the life of the church. 
Before getting into that, let me give you a very short, really insufficient review of boundaries and their impact. Again, read that book every day, read it with your Bible, You'll find it's biblically based, relying on scriptures, and you'll need your Bible to refer to its many references. But it will give you a fuller understanding of boundaries and the principles that need to be in place to love God and your neighbor as yourself. As defined in the book, mental health depends upon mental, physical, emotional and spiritual boundaries to help distinguish what is a person's responsibility and what isn't. When there's inability to set appropriate boundaries at the appropriate times with the appropriate people, life can be very destructive. Christians are often confused about how to set appropriate limits. And worse yet, those in the church sometimes manipulate others and violate boundaries. People have to learn how one can set limits and still be a loving person. What's more, how do Christians who are called to a life of service answer those who ask for time, money, energy, and love? And still yet, why is there often guilt when boundaries are set? Aren't boundaries selfish? For instance, when was the last time you were asked to do something for the church, you smiled and said you would be there, and then walked away asking yourself, why did I do that? That sick feeling in your gut was telling you a boundary had been violated. For whatever reason, you allowed yourself to believe you were supposed to say yes, and saying no would be like saying no to God, and who wants to do that? Except there was a boundary crossed in your not being honest in your intentions and motivation for doing so. And the ministry that, and now you feel some resentment toward the person that asked you and the ministry they represented and maybe even the church as a whole. So you blame the church because you certainly can't blame God, right? But you ask yourself, are you feeling a separation in relationship with that person, that ministry, or God even? If so, a boundary has been crossed and that is not of the will of God. On the other side of this is the one who is asking for help. When a boundary is, is expressed, we are called to respect that decision. Understanding that no person can change another, we have to allow others to have their boundaries and accept when they also say no. And while we can't change others and make them accept our views and do what we want them to do, we can allow them to experience their consequences. Let me give you an example one time when I was dealing with children. I was holding in this church some sessions on, how, uh, on, on parenting, parenting classes. And it was billed as how to get your kids to stop doing what you don't want them to do and start doing what you do want them to do. That pretty much summarizes parenting, right? <laughs> For the first session, the room was packed with parents who were stressed out in some measure or another by their kids. However... By the third session, about half of them were gone. I had a feeling what was going on. Not that their kids were now models of perfect behavior, but these parents didn't want to set boundaries with their children and hold them to consequences. They allowed themselves to be manipulated by the tantrums and crying screams the kids intuitively know will eventually help them get their way if they do it long enough. Some parents can't or won't set boundaries, even when the benefit is a home that's calm and orderly and everyone lives with the expectation of boundaries that foster love. However, one mother did come to me after a few weeks. She said that her life had changed and was so much better now because she had learned to set boundaries and calmly enforce the consequences. And I have to point out that this woman had four kids under the age of six. Now she had kids that she could love and enjoy, but not that this is always easy. When Jesus told the rich, young man, the rich man to sell all he had and give to the poor, the man walked away very sad, and Jesus let him walk. Sometimes others will choose not to continue a relationship with us. It can hurt, 
But hurting does not necessarily mean harming. In fact, not setting boundaries can be even worse. Growing up with no boundaries has landed more than one pr person in prison or a recovery center. Love each other then as you would be loved. Set the boundaries you need and respect those which you are given. As Cloud and Townsend explain, the concept of boundaries is modeled in the very nature of God. The Christian view of God is as a distinct, separate being who takes responsibility for God's self through expressions in creation and the Bible. God is separate from creation and human beings. God tells us what he likes and does not like, what he will allow and he will not allow. And God confronts sin primarily through allowing consequences for behavior. He also made us in his likeness in that humans have personal responsibility to model good boundaries by following limits set upon us and not interfering with natural consequences when others do violate boundaries. Jesus also modeled boundaries and upheld them. He didn't always make himself available to the crowds, especially when they wanted healing or wanted to be fed with fish and loaves again. He often sought time away for himself for prayer and rest, refusing to be manipulated. When he was tempted in the desert, he, w he maintained boundaries by not giving in to the devil, despite his hunger from fasting, a false need to prove he was the son of God, or a desire to be worshipped by the world. When Peter challenged him for saying he would be turned over to the authorities and killed, Jesus unloaded on Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan! Jesus would not allow even those closest to him to change his mission into coming into the world as a personal Messiah, not as a political one. Most important, though, Jesus proclaimed in the Sermon on the Mount, he did not come to change the law, but to fulfill it. I've said before that while Jesus challenged the Pharisees on some things like Sabbath practices, it was only when the laws oppressed others that he disagreed with them, or more so when he saw the law being misused for power and not for love. Those parts of the law with which he agreed, he upheld, or in some cases even strengthened, as in equating hate with outright murder. So the boundaries we find in the Bible, such as the Ten Commandments and other directives given by God, are clearly out of a desire to protect our relationships in love with God and each other. As it is, abuse and dysfunction are directly related to lack of boundaries. I am so very grateful to the United Methodist Church and its programs across the denomination to train clergy in sexual ethics and to require procedures to protect children in our care. Now, I realize background checks may seem a little over at the top for those who only want to serve snacks at vacation Bible school, but these are so <laughs> necessary in ensuring kids are safe from predators. And while we want to express our love to everyone, I have to say, not all church members know what an appropriate hug looks like. For some, Touching in any manner is frightening and offensive. A wide smile with direct eye contact can communicate just as much warmth and love as God would have us give while we're respecting those boundaries between us. But if you would ever witness how a church could be destroyed, just let one accusation of sexual misconduct arise, and it is years and years for the church to recover the faith and trust it had in what Christ preaches. Again, boundaries are not restrictive, but rather protective of God's people and the mission in Christ we are given. From the Christian view, God's creation is based on natural and logical laws which determine our boundaries. If one indulges in unhealthy behaviors, one reaps the consequences through addiction, d disease, and death. And it's not that God does not care, but he allows humans to choose their lifestyles and behaviors. The only time the consequence of boundaries of behaviors is removed is with the Christian belief in the saving, saving grace of the cross. 
We believe that God's plan to reconcile with us and the effects of the sin in the garden happened in the death and resurrection of the Son of God, in our acceptance of Christ's loving act in standing before God and eliminating that separation, that sin, between God and us as creation, we are spiritually restored to Eden. But even that acceptance is a choice. Even in our salvation, God respects whatever boundaries we erect between us. What better example, though, demonstrates how we are created and made for boundaries and God's desire to live within them. Now, I have to say, this message is so incomplete. There's so much more to be said and understood about boundaries. And I'm sure there are many questions floating out there. But let me say again, read boundaries, and read your Bible from this perspective of those boundaries. Should implementing them be difficult for you? I'm going to ask, and I believe he actually already has, placed in the church lobby a list of Christian counselors you could consult for help. I believe it would be the most courageous thing you can do and still the most loving thing you can do in order to love God and love each other as you would be loved. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, you created us and you call us unto you because you desire so much to love us. But you love us so much that you are willing to wait for our love. You are willing to see if we will be who you would have us be. If we will learn these boundaries that you have given to us and that we will practice boundaries in our relationships with each other. And in doing so, Lord, we become a people that are not inwardly, inwardly focused, but rather focused on you and focused in that amazing love that you have for us. In doing so, Lord, you actually make us into a holy people. So it is, dear God, that we pray that we may be these people that you would have us be that we may love you and love others, that we may do so in ways that lift one another up, that protect one another, and that bring us, Lord, together in that love. We thank you for this, and so we give this to you. Again, in Jesus' holy and blessed name, amen. But I just wanted to um, both and any ladies there in our audience or on stage, um, if you've been to a WAG event, whether it was a series of grace, a connect, um, a social gathering, but if you have been touched by anything, if you had any kind of impact, whether it was meeting someone new, getting to know someone better, um, God spoken to you, if you could just stand up, please. If you haven't been to one of our events, we've we welcome you and we invite you to join and hopefully standing with us one day. Thanks. Good morning. I'm Patty Hibble. I came to Isle of Faith over 30 years ago when it was Isle of Palms United Methodist not seeking a church home, but a pastor to perform my wedding ceremony. I'd had a bad experience as a young adult in church and vowed not to fall for that scandal again. But it was Wilma Owsley's testimony one Sunday that made me find hope and safety that this church offered. Over the years, I've been most comfortable laying low in my church activities. I've been content with worshiping on Sundays and taking part in a few behind the scenes committees. This year, I was asked to be part of the staff parish relations committee. I was amongst a group of people who I perceived as 
really good Christians. And then there was me. I was honored to serve with them, but I felt somewhat intimidated and insecure in my Christian self. At our first meeting, we were asked to share something about ourselves that the others might not know. Wow, there were some real exciting stories. Sandy's cross-country bike excursion. Megan, she swam on her college swim team. Go Aggies, sorry about yesterday. Carol. Carol's a world traveler. She can tell you where the best gelato and shopping can be found. There were stories of sailboat vacations, hiking the Appalachian Trail, and skydiving. And then there was me. Boring homebody me. When it was my turn, I shared that I liked to go dumpster diving. Oh, whoopee, the others must be thinking. She likes to rummage through other people's trash. <laughs> A far cry from the inspirational stories the others shared. We were also given a calendar of the year's meeting dates in which each of us was already assigned a month's meeting in which we were to give a short devotion beforehand. Panic set in when I saw my name by the month of May. When I asked Carol Penover to explain the expectation, she said, eh, I just do something simple and add a prayer. What? Pray in front of others? As a somewhat shy person, I'm not capable of speaking in front of people, and I certainly can't pray in front of others. When I get nervous, stupid things come out of my mouth. Anxiety set in, and I knew I had to come up with a plan, probably one to get out of it. But some way, somehow, I came up with a video devotion. I'll pick up, back up shortly but I want to present to you what I named Transformation 101. As I shared previously, I enjoy dumpster diving or roadside rescues to be politically correct. I love looking at something and imagining what it would be like with the rust removed, dressed up with new paint, added shiny new hardware. Wobbly legs repaired to carry its own weight, old faded decals removed, bright touches of gold. Some of the pieces I've come across have taken a keen imagination and a few start overs to make it work. I've often seen why it was easier to throw it away and just buy new, perfect pieces. You can imagine David's face when I asked him to go with me to help load up a piece I'd found on the roadside and hurry before someone gets it. Sadly, for some of my finds, I've neglected the before pictures, and I can't fully remember the neglected condition. But even with pictures, one can't fully appreciate the dirt, rhyme, and cuss words I've uncovered. And upon stripping one desk, there were a few words written in Sharpie that surely got someone's rear end blistered. Someone had just covered the offensive language with a coat or two of paint. Nonetheless, the words were really still there. But with some elbow grease, paint stripper, and a variety of sandpapers and some decorative papers, it was like new. Some pieces found a totally new purpose. I 
I'm reminded that I too have offenses that I've attempted to cover up with excuses and blame. And only by making mistakes and taking the wrong roads did I come to a dead end and found Jesus in my life. Sometimes I forget what terrible shape I was in. But what's important is the after picture. While I'm a work in progress, I am reminded of King David, a man after God's own heart who made mistakes and some really bad choices. And I'm amazed at Saul's transformation to Paul. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. A relationship with Jesus can strip away the uglies in our life. We can often find a totally new purpose. In Natalie Grant's song, Clean, she sings... I see shattered, you see whole. I see broken, but you see beautiful. And you're helping me to believe. You're restoring me piece by piece. There's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy. You wash me in mercy. I am clean. A couple of weeks ago, I noticed a pile on the side of San Pablo. And every time I passed by, I'd look to see what was there. In hopes of discouraging, David would say, it's all junk. Junk or necking. But then I zoomed in on this. So that night, as the traffic died down, it began to drizzle. And I knew it was rescue time. She was dirty, moldy, wobbly, and holy, but she was quite heavy. We took her home, and a new life began. As David began to sand the crud away, I could see we scored a winner. Good bones, I kept telling him. She's a work in progress, and I'm not sure where she'll end up, what she'll look like with new paint, new fabric, or an unwobbly leg, or which room she'll serve in. But I see beautiful, piece by piece. My prayer is that we all see good bones in ourselves and others, and that with Jesus, we can all be restored piece by piece. I was out of town when this was presented, so I wasn't certain how it was received. Much to my pleasure, as I serve communion the following Sunday, Megan, one of the SPRC members, whispered to me, great video. She later asked me if I would be willing to speak at the Women of Grace meeting that was coming up. <laughs> I can't talk in front of people. But somehow, I survived that, and here I stand again. But suffice it to say, I've learned my lesson. Carol, my devotion next time will be short, Sweet and normal. <laughs> when Megan and Jude asked me to speak, they really didn't know much about me. They didn't know my successes or my failures. They didn't know about my walk with God or my run from him. They only really knew that I like to go junking. But in my life, I have made many poor decisions. I didn't ask God's direction or listen to his oh-so-small voice. I seem to think that as an adult, I was now in control of my decisions, my life, and my destiny. But that didn't always work out as I planned. 
It wasn't until I had a child that I came to a full realization what an unhealthy environment that I brought him in. And shortly afterwards, I filed for a divorce from his dad. Over those six years, I had been made to feel much like that chair on the side of the road, ugly, disgusting, past my prime. Nobody would want me, an embarrassment. I was broken. Like that chair, there were prettier, better made, higher quality pieces we'd both seen our days. But also like that chair, I was rescued. God was with me all those years, from the days when I said I would never set foot in a church again, to the days my head was swirling with, what am I going to do now? God never wanted me to enter into a toxic relationship, but he lets us make our own decisions. He was hurting to see the hurt. The Bible tells us when we suffer, he suffers. As I mentioned in the video, that only by making mistakes and taking the wrong roads did I come to a dead end and found Jesus in my life. Sometimes I forget what terrible shape I was in, but what's important is the after picture. I'm a daily work in progress. I've come to realize that I've been covered by his grace. I can clearly see that he placed people in my path throughout the years to get me to this point. From Wilma's inspiration 30 years ago, making me comfortable, feel comfortable in a place, in a safe environment, to my now husband David, a kind, loving, and giving man who accepted my son and me as his family. Even on my worst days, David makes me feel loved and worthy. Rascal Flat sings a song, God bless the broken road that led me straight to you. And I'm so happy to say that on our, on our next anniversary, we will celebrate 25 years of a strong, wonderful, and healthy marriage. God has forgiven me for my sins and disobedience, but the hardest thing has been for me to forgive myself. I've regularly beaten myself up with, what was I thinking? Or how could I knowingly bring a child into such an unhealthy environment? I'm tired of beating myself up and I finally found peace with myself. I can't change my past, but it has made me who I am today. I'm so glad that God has seen the good bones in me and I understand that my good bones aren't the same as others' good bones. It's not a matter of really good Christians versus the not so good Christians. We're all sinners. We all have good bones. Sometimes we just need to recognize they're undercover. During my most difficult times, I didn't turn to my friends, my family, or my church family. During those times when I needed God's guidance, I didn't turn to him. The enemy wanted me to believe that God was disappointed in me, that I had rejected him, when in fact he was patiently waiting for me to let go of control. Jesus took all my failures, my many, many sins, my guilt, my shame, and he took it with him as he hung on that cross. Lastly, I pray that if you have self-doubts, if you feel unworthy or broken, that you readily accept the freedom he gives us and also know that we the people of this church are here for one another. Together, we are here to provide strength, encouragement, and wisdom. We are here to celebrate each other's successes and support one another during our struggles and insecurities. Thank you.
So I know we're running just um, a few minutes late, and I'm going to ask you to be patient because I really feel like that we need to have a time of response with that. And my first question is, if you have not met Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, he loves you, and there is an opportunity to receive him. Pastor Will is here if you want to come and pray with him. But I also want to go back to what Connie said about the boundaries. So many of us have been hurt in the walls of the church by people. Um, sometimes I hurt people and I don't even realize that I hurt people. But there are offenses that happen and that causes division in the body of Christ. And so I just want to speak to that today, that if there is something, um, maybe someone crossed your boundary and they didn't realize it, maybe you manipulated and didn't realize it and crossed somebody else's boundary, but we are the body of Christ. And so I pray if there is any offense that you have towards anyone here, if you have an offense towards a ministry, something that's happened in the past, you know, today is the day. Just ask God to come and to heal that place in you. And so I just pray that we are a healthy body of Christ, and that's what the women are doing. We are learning about boundaries. We're learning about trust. We're learning about being safe for one another so that we can grow in Christ together in a healthy place. So I'm going to sing clean, and I want um, the ladies here, they're going to show by example here. They're going to go, and they're going to pray. And I want you, if you want to pray, if you want someone to pray with you, grab somebody. But let's do work here. This is a time of response for us to actually live out and implement what the Spirit has been saying to us this morning. So feel free to come to the altar. Feel free to pray. If you see someone that you want to um, get right with, go, go to their chair. Go grab them and take them to the altar. This is our time to respond. So let's do that now. Anybody that's willing to pray, if you guys will come down front. I see shadows. You see hope.
you can stand for our benediction. <clears throat> Join hands, your neighbor, and hear this word from Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love. All the days of your vain life that are given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life, and your toll it, which you toll under the sun. This is a scripture that reminds us men that the women in our lives are gifts, gifts to be treasured, not tools to be broken and worn out. <laughs> women in our life, quite often for some of us, are the lifeblood that have allowed us to live, you know, that taught us how to be men. So we thank God for giving us those who love us and teach us to love. And we ask that we too can go from this place and be inspired by what we have heard and to be motherly and fatherly, to be a holy parent to all that God puts in our path. We thank you, Lord, and we go in the strength of the Spirit. We go as parents to the world, just as you loved us to love others. We go in peace. Amen. Men, after Sunday school, get on back over here, practice our songs. It was 20 minutes, that's it, 20 minutes. Don't forget to sign up for the accessory swap in the narthex. We want to see you there.